just last week, the the military guys called me out there to do a blessing on on, on uh, the fifty seven soldiers that they took out of this Mark Cemetery, Mark mind you, military so just to build a courthouse there downtown Tucson and a thousand Spanish descendants that were buried there from these to build this thing. But the soldiers took them to a, to a national cemetery and they had all these little coffins out there you know, they made for them. And all the service branches were there and carried them there. And they wanted me to go there and do a blessing for these people, you know, which I can do. There's no problem with that. But, you know, I just kind of thought to myself, now, you know, how we feel when it happens to our people, the same thing that's happening to these people that are there. NAGPRA is a human rights statute. It is a process. It's a tool. Level playing field. Uh, and uh, bring the ancestors back home. It's about relationships. NAGPRA is civil rights legislation. NAGPRA itself outlines the expectation of tribes and museums. A reconciliation. That they were not collectibles, that they were not specimens, but they were, uh, they were uh, ancestors of people who are alive now. happily surprised uh, over the past years at the relationship that has evolved between many museums and many tribes. It's not universal, uh, but I think what has happened is that uh, a number of tribes have been, uh, and, and traditional people, have been surprised uh, in a good way uh, to find out that their uh, their traditional uh, ways of life are being preserved and have been preserved through the collections that are in museums. That's where these things went. Well, I do think it's working. Um, oh, uh, at its very uh, basic level, I think it's changed the way almost um, all of us feel about uh, American Indian and uh, other Native American human remains. Um, the, the idea that uh, they are matter, items of curiosity or uh, the subject of scientific study really, I think, is secondary now to most, for most of us. We now appreciate the fact that um, um, Native American human remains and grave goods ought to be accorded the same respect as the remains from uh, our uh, um, ancestors, uh, those of us from the dominant society. I have continued to work with NAGPRA from its inception in 1990 uh, up until uh, the present. And I, my role has been as a member of a, a nonprofit Hawaiian organization called Hui Malama Ina Kupuna Ohova Ine. And we have conducted over 100 NAGPRA repatriations uh, from museums in Hawaii and throughout the continental United States. I think for, oh, for the last 100 and 150 years, museums have collected vast amounts of stuff. And I'll speak on behalf of the museum that I was director of. Um, we basically didn't know what we had. And we had pretty good catalog control. But intellectual control, knowing what it was, making it available, we really didn't know. NAGPRA has forced us to do what we just had never gotten around to doing, which is to clean up our mess, find out what we had collected, what we had excavated, uh, get it into a condition where it could be shared with other people. And I think when we look back, we'll see that NIPRA made more information available, which allowed more research questions to be answered than uh, any other single piece of legislation. And in terms of, uh, archeo of, of data being lost, data are lost every day. This is not news. Uh, I think NIPRA produced far more than it will have ever cost us.
I think it's important to establish, establish those really positive relationships with universities and museums because actually a lot of times the staff at those places, they inherit those remains. They inherit those items. And I think sometimes um, there are people that aren't really um, knowledgeable about how that stuff happens. You know, tribal people, they get very angry and they get very um, um, passionate, of course, about the issue, but I think they're blaming the wrong person. And so we've tried really hard to create really good working relationships with these individuals at these institutions, and it's worked for us um, continually for a couple of years now, and we've gotten a lot done just by finding that common ground. On a personal level, I think NAGPRA has had some impact with uh, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. What it has done, it has allowed our tribe to reclaim some of the materials that have been in museums. It's allowed us to, to reclaim some human remains that we've known about that uh, have been in various museums across the southeastern United States. We haven't repatriated a large number of human remains because we've been, we've waited to take our time. We have wanted to be certain that the materials were Choctaw and that either the Mississippi Band of Choctaw or any of the other bands of Choctaw Indians in Louisiana didn't want to exert a, a closer claim. We've decided that we didn't want to make a claim for human remains if any other Choctaw tribes felt that they were more closely re related to them. I've seen the, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma become more involved in making repatriation requests as they've started gaining an understanding, an, an understanding of how important human remains are to many of the traditional leaders here in Oklahoma and in Mississippi. We see it as an exercise in some regard of tribal sovereignty, to be able to bring our ancestors back and, and to place them in areas where they can be well tended and well cared for rather than, rather than in a museum setting. One project that has been deeply gratifying is the completion of our process for repatriation of culturally unidentifiable Native American remains found on state and private lands in Colorado. That process, the roots of that began in 1997 when um, the Ute tribes in particular in this state were concerned about what was happening to their ancestors that um, perhaps would be cared for in the museum for a long period of time. And we wrote a NAGPRA grant in 2005. Uh, that grant was to consult with tribes to develop a process. And we had a series of regional consultations that helped us to frame this process. We presented the process before the NAGPRA Review Committee in 2006, and we have presented it uh, in subsequent review committee meetings. And just in 2008, November of 2008, received authorization from the Department of Interior to proceed with that process. So um, for me, that was personally gratifying because then that was uh, 11 years in the making. So I have learned that with NAGPRA, a lot of things take time and patience. Well, we like to put like certain, what we call medicines in their plants and whatnot with the remains to kind of let them know that we're there for them and we're trying to do something for them. So we're looking over these remains, we're putting cedar in the boxes and wrapping some of them up in white cloth and we get to this um, Quaker Oats box and it's probably from like the 50s and it's really old and the woman I was working with, my boss, uh, was like, oh, what's in here? And she opens it up and it's a complete uh, skeleton of a fetus. It's like a newborn. We all just stopped, you know, and just like really hit home like what what we were doing and 
we couldn't continue on with the work after that. You know, it just was too emotional and it was just really difficult because you think when that woman had that baby, you know, she probably the hardest thing she's ever going to go through is losing this child, especially a newborn. And then she buries it and then, you know, you, it's like all being played out right there. Like, okay, she buries this child and that's the last thing, you know, this is burial ceremony. And then it's reburied, you know, and so this, it's like, if we can do whatever we can to rebury this this baby, because that's what it is. It's not a CUI. It's not a part of a collection. It's a it's a baby. So what we can do to put this baby back to rest, we try to do. I'll tell you a little story from my own um, youth. Uh, I grew up in Iowa. Um, we periodically would visit the Iowa State Historical Museum in Des Moines, and I recall very vividly when I was a kid, uh, you'd walk in the front door and turn it very sharply to the right and there was a display and in the display was Black Hawk's human remains. Chief Black Hawk. And that was the first place that all young kids went when they went into the museum. And now I think back on that, I'm embarrassed that that was part of my youth and I, uh, I'm very grateful and, and uh, pleased that the museum has repatriated those remains and that they've been um, properly taken care of by the tribe and that uh, Black Hawk is no longer an object of, uh, of curiosity in that same way. And I think that's a change that's pretty uni universal in the, in the country. One of my uh, memorable uh, experiences in uh, working on the law was a uh, Senate hearing that was being held <clears throat> um, in which uh, uh, some of the art dealers from uh, Santa Fe came in to testify and, uh, against the, the statute. And uh, they brought, uh, it seems to me as my recollection, some very heavy neg negative energy into the hearing room wanting to keep uh, shirts with human scalps and, and other uh, items, you know, uh, uh, with Indian body parts, you know, for a commercial sale. And it, it was a very uh, negative kind of a cast a pale over the hearing and, and um, uh, among all of the native witnesses and uh, participants, you know, at, in the hearing, you know, to hear this kind of testimony, the, the really uh, underbelly, I guess, you know, of uh, some of the interests that were opposing the uh, return of, of our native dead, to hear that be surface in congressional testimony. And as we've, uh, I personally felt a low point in my own heart, um, all of a sudden, uh, the room hearing doors opened and a number of uh, native Hawaiians came into the room uh, who were going to be offering testimony from, from Hawaii. And uh, they came into the back of the room and uh, leaned up against the walls and uh, brought some very powerful mana into the hearing. And I. I think that uh, we, we did carry the day in that hearing and that through their power that they, the uh, spiritual power that they brought into the hearing room and they made, it made everything okay again and we, we moved forward from that point. For one, just obviously I have a full-time job with having you know NAGPRA in my life but it goes a lot you know deeper and bigger than that um it affords me to help out my um, you know Anishinaabe tribe you know my first first family is what we call that you know your your tribe and I'm able to do things that maybe other people in the tribe can't do like putting these claims for sacred items you know identify these remains who to me are Anishinaabe I mean CUI is just a terminology that you know it gets used a lot but you know when I'm talking to other other Indians other Anishinaabe it's like you know this old Anishinaabe you know or, or just the old ones so I have an opportunity to like pursue these old ones 
rebury them, you know, that's huge. I hope that we can see a day when all those um, ancestors are home and back where they're supposed to be, and when these processes are just kind of, you know, I, I run of the mill, you know, where it just it happens, we know what's going to happen, the process is enacted, and we're somewhere else. We're moved on talking about some other challenge, because goodness knows there's lots of other challenges to work on. Um, but, but I am really, I am thankful for, for NAG for being there as the way that it's flawed and, and all the good things about it. So thanks to the people who, who work to get it there and who try to make it better all the time. I think one of the uh, outstanding unfinished businesses uh, under the statute, however, as we look upon this 20-year anniversary, is the proper disposition of these uh, 120,000 uh, uh, dead Indians that remain in museum uh, uh, vaults today. And uh, it's our, our position that uh, they should be treated just like uh, American law and social policy in all 50 states and the District of Columbia guarantee the uh, uh, bur decent burial of every person that dies, including uh, unknown strangers, uh, paupers, uh, prison inmates, unclaimed dead. Everyone gets a proper burial um, uh, under the, the laws uniformly throughout the nation. And it is our hope that uh, that, that same uh, treatment and sensibility will obtain to the 120,000 dead Indians um, that are still warehoused in museums and universities. And that would be the best way to celebrate the 20th uh, year anniversary of the NAGPRA statute, in my opinion. I guess I want to say thank you to, to Congress for giving us NAGPRA. And I say it, <laughs> I say it in a, a weird way because I, I say it laughing like that because there's, there is criticism in Indian country of NAGPRA. But um, and although I will sit here and tell you about the 123,000 sets of ancestral remains that haven't come home and this work that needs to be done, I can also tell you about, you know, the other sets of remains that have come home. And so, and, and the, setting this process um, into place. I think it's humbled me a lot because I had a lot of assumptions about what I thought I knew as an archaeologist and as a scientist and as a woman. And, uh, it has humbled me. I've, I've been privileged to take part in events that I never would have imagined taking part in. And I've built some deep, lasting friendships. And it's really helped me to gain empathy for understanding belief systems that are not my own. And that's what's really, I think, important in a struggle with this is that I've heard so many times people say, well, what's the big deal? If it were my grandmother, I wouldn't care. Well, the big deal is it's not your grandmother, it's someone else's grandmother, and they do care. You know, and so I think building empathy is and under cross-cultural understanding has been pretty pivotal for me. The last reburial I did was, it was January. We just got the remains back. And it was from a disposition. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to have these hanging out in my office all winter, you know? So I got my snowshoes on and uh, threw them on my back, you know, and I had the shovel and I was like trekking through the woods and I was like, I hope the ground's unfroze. If not, I'm gonna have to start a fire. But luckily I started digging and the ground was unfrozen. You know, it's just like, cool, you know, you feel really good. You know, you're reburying and, and the remains were all kids, you know, just like little itty bitty skulls and just little guys, you know. And they're from right down where I grew up in Mackinac City, which is like 20 miles from Cross Village. So this is like real personal. And it's like felt really good, you know, it's like I did something good today. You know, it's just like something I can be proud of. I call my mom and she's all happy and tell other people. I was like, oh, that's, that's a good thing. So.